My name is Jessica. I, this is my 10th year at this church. I grew up in a church that was very conservative in the Bible Belt, Baptist. You know, we weren't even allowed to clap. <laughs> so we definitely weren't delivering demonic spirits from people. So when Greg announced this back in October, I was just fascinated. You know, I never heard anything like this. It was just unreal. Like, how can this be true? I grew up in a really dark home, very dysfunctional, rampant domestic violence all in front of me. I mean, no child should ever have to see those things that I saw. I don't remember a time when I was a child that I wasn't terrified. It's just, I've carried it with me my whole life. I already had victory in God. I did not go into this with any addiction, any, I mean, God had saved me from it. I had victory, but I never had freedom, never. It was always, always so heavy, the pain, the darkness, and, I, and you just kind of think it's normal after a while. I felt like I was born with a, a bag on my back, and every time something would happen, Satan would just add a pebble to it. You know, you wouldn't notice it. It wasn't heavy, but then you notice it. When, when you notice it, it's too late. You're just carrying around 100 pounds of just darkness that you didn't even know was there that most people don't even recognize. And, and you don't know it until you put it down. And that's what deliverance was for me. It was God telling me, all you have to do is put it down. So my deliverance, what can I say? <laughs> it was incredible. If there aren't enough words in the world, not even in the dictionary, to describe that, what happened in that room. But when I tell you, I would sit in that room, not four hours, I would sit in that room 400 hours to feel what I feel now. It's just the most incredible thing I've ever done. Everything in my life has changed after deliverance. There's nothing that is the same. There's nothing that could be the same. The way I see things now is so different. My mind is so renewed and I can't describe it because it's supernatural. The depression is gone. I've been on antidepressants since I was 21 years old. I've taken them for 23 years. I have been diagnosed with PTSD, bipolar one, major depression, chronic anxiety. I took medicine for everything. I have a twin sister and she's just such a gift. All the pain in my childhood, I never had to go through it alone. We always had each other. And the generational curse that was broken in that room was not just broken over me, it was broken over her. And I wanna read something that she sent me. She said, Jess, <clears throat> I had a thought this morning, and I was gonna wait to say this in person, but I wanna say it now. Something happened to me after your deliverance. I don't know if it's because we share the same DNA, or maybe God just loves me that much, or maybe another reason, but my life completely changed. I've never felt so much love and joy and peace in the 44 years I've been on earth. I've never felt so loved. Your deliverance changed my life. I saw how it transformed you and I couldn't believe my eyes. I don't know why it took me so long to get to this point, but God did it on purpose. I just thank him for my happiness today. And so now I wanna thank you for your part. I'm not being dramatic when I say, God changed my life through yours. That's what deliverance did for me and my family. We are in a war. This is a battle and my God, how much easier it is to fight it now when that Bible is gone. It's a freedom that I've never experienced in my whole life. And I've been a Christian my whole life, but he always wants to give us more. And that's what he did. You just have, it's something you have to experience for yourself. I don't think there's a person at our church that could not benefit and I hope Every person in this church who's desperate and just searching and wondering why hasn't God taken this from me, He will, and He has, and we win. We win every time. That's the reason right there that I keep doing the way, what I'm doing. You know, when you... See something you can't unsee that is so impactful on your life and so impactful on other people's lives, then you can't stop doing it because it changes their life. 
I've watched people for over 30 years in ministry. I know you're thinking, you're not that old. Thank you. But I've watched people all this time, and I see the struggles, the struggles, the struggles, struggles with addiction, struggles with depression, struggles with anger, struggles with fear, struggles with divorce, struggles with worry, anxiety. Over and over again, it's like they they live in this cycle, and they can't break out of it. And I always ask myself, Jesus, if you came to set us free, then why aren't we completely free? And you know what God revealed to me is because there was a piece of the message that we weren't applying. And so we just started applying it here at Crossroads last year. And the results have been phenomenal for people's lives. Individual, real people that you've been watching up here on the screen. And the results are very um, connected to your spiritual walk. If you're not pursuing Jesus, the results are not the same because you can kick them out, but you're going to invite them back in. But when you get to the place where you're serious about God and you want God's and you're willing to get things out of your life as the Holy Spirit empowers you, then I promise you, you will never be the same again. Never be the same again. And some people are like, well, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if I need that. The answer is yes. I'm not sure means that you know there's something in your life that shouldn't be there and you don't know how to get rid of it. As a matter of fact, I had a a pastor and his wife contact me about six weeks ago. Say, hey, um, you've been talking about this. Uh, We're we're interested. And what he was really saying is, I'm interested because my wife needs this, you know. Uh, Y'all know how that works, right? If you fix her, we'll be great, you know. And so anyway, uh, I said, well, here's the process. Uh, You you have to do some homework to be prepared. And so they did the homework. And can I just say that this is somebody that loves, loves Jesus. Wants everything that God has for him. But he knew something was missing. And this is what he said. Something's messing with me. I said, you're right. There is something messing with you. But it won't be when we get done. So he sat down, changed his life, changed his marriage. It changed it so much that his wife texted me that night, sign me up. Why? Because the proof was standing in front of her. And so I'm just here to tell you, amen. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe what the Bible says. But you will keep carrying what you're carrying and keep struggling what you're struggling with, and you'll keep trying to discipline yourself to victory, but you'll keep struggling with it because the demons on the inside of you are a whole lot easier to fight when they're on the outside of you. And so many people think, well, I ain't got any demons. Really? Well, if you got nothing to lose, then try it. If there's nothing there, it'd be a short session. Nobody has ever come and said, I don't, I don't think I really need to be here, but you know, I'm going to do this. And then they get through it like, oh man, I needed to be here like a long time ago. And it's, it's, it's not something to be afraid of. Listen, I want to remind you of something. Jesus, in the Great Commission, he gave us this statement. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore. Why did he connect those two? Because he was trying to get you to understand and me to understand that I'm not sending you out on your own. I'm sending you out with authority. Authority and power over your personal life and over the spiritual world around you. Church, wake up. The devil is coming after your kids. He's coming after our community. And he's going to make us think that it's just society that's doing it, but he is manipulating everything around us. If we don't open our eyes, then we'll lose our families. Amen. I'm actually reading a book right now on, uh, <clears throat> on how to take uh, kids and teenagers through uh, the deliverance process. And the reason I'm doing that is because uh, I'm writing a sermon, uh, probably it's going to be a couple of sermons, on uh, generational curses. 
And I've been studying it. I got so many notes. I'm just putting it all together. That's how I do it. I just keep collecting stuff and looking at word studies and stuff. And uh, what we're, what we're going to see is a very evident pattern in Scripture that you have got things that you don't even know you have that came from your family members two or three generations back, maybe up to four generations. And it could be cancer. It could be diabetes. It could be a physical ailment. It could be an emotional element. You're like, why am I this way? Well, there's a reason. And listen, if it's spiritual, then God gives you the answer. You can get it out. But if it's just something that, you know, you got to change the way you're thinking, God can help you with that too. You see, God gives us a complete gospel. And when we talk about this spiritual warfare that we're in, I don't want you to be blind to it, but I don't want you to be afraid of it. I'm going to talk about it, right? If it, if it offends you, then let God's word offend you, okay? He talks about it in scripture. And the reason we're talking about it so much right now is because the church has never talked about it. They just don't talk about it. It's, it's, it's taboo. We don't talk about demons. Why? Because everybody's got some. Listen, there's only one reason why we would not talk about what Jesus talks about in Scripture. There's only one reason, and that's because of the influence of the enemy. There's really only one reason why we don't read our Bible. It's because of the influence of the enemy. There's really only one reason why we don't pray. It's because of the influence of the enemy. It's not just you got bad habits and you can't pick up a new habit. There is something going on in your life that you don't realize and God will reveal it to you in the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus will free you from it. That's what the power is. There's power in his name. That's why his disciples came back. They were like giddy when they came back, 72 of them. They're like, Jesus, you, you, this is amazing. Even the demons were subject to us in your name. Why did they say that? Because they hadn't experienced. They saw Jesus do it, and they realized we got the same authority that Jesus has. So use it, church. Use it. Right. Right. Amen? So, with all that said, when we listen to stories like this, that's why twice a week I meet with people. That's why they come into my office. That's why over 200 people here at Crossroads Church, over 200 have been through the Breaking Free experience. And there are people at other churches. I'm having other churches call me right now and say, hey, when can we get in? I'm like, well, you're gonna have to get in line with our people because they're going first, all right? And so we got this long list of people that are going through that. And people who go through it, lives are forever changed. And now you have the power to keep the doors closed. And one of the powers or the, the process to keep things out is this armor that God gives us. God gives us spiritual armor. And this spiritual armor is to keep things out and to be in battle. You see, armor is not given to us so we can try to be a Christian. Not too many people are in churches trying to be Christians. Let me ask you a question for those of you who are married. After you walked out of the church or wherever you got married, justice of a peace or, or on a cruise ship or wherever it was, did you walk out and say, you know what, now I'm going to try to be married? Now you're married, right? Whether you're sober when you did it or not, it's a different question, right? But you're married. You got the ring, you got the license. So no, you don't try to be married anymore. You are married. Now you live like a married person, right? So when you get saved and you're, in the, you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't try to be a Christian anymore. You just become who you already are, right? You just live it out. And what we're talking about is how we live it out, the power that God gives us to keep the enemy at bay. And he tells us, listen, I want you as a believer to walk in this power because I didn't save you for the couch. I saved you for war. I saved you for, well, you realize that when you said, Jesus, I want you to come into my life, you actually said, Jesus, I am ready to be enlisted in your army. Yes. And maybe you didn't get that message, but that's the message. You or I are in a war that we should now realize before we were in a war that we didn't realize. 
We were captive by it. And so now God says, listen, I'm giving you this spiritual armor for a spiritual battle because I want you to stop looking at everything as people around you or circumstances. I want you to see it through a different lens. And if you see it through the different lens, then you're on your way to victory. If you don't see it, you'll never win. So he tells us, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities. You see any principalities lately? Nope. I see that manifestation of them. You see any spiritual host of wickedness? No, but I see the manifestation of them. Do you see any demonic forces? No, but I see the manifestation of them. How do I see it? Fear, rebellion, worry, anxiety, all those things. All those things are the work of the enemy and the enemy uses our flesh against us. And so anger, bitterness, rage, retaliation, suicides, worthlessness, unworthiness, all these mentalities, all these different things are spiritual attacks that you're under and you think, you know what, I just need to get my act together. But if you don't step into the power of God, you cannot get your act together because that is what the spirits around us push at us and try to overcome us. And then when we fall into agreement with it, then we begin to run with it. How does that happen? You say, you know what, I'm just depressed. Boom, you just claimed it. It's not just you, it's yours now. Or you pronounce it on somebody else. You're just angry all the time. So now you just pronounce that word on them, right? The Bible says there's life and death in the power of the word. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, listen, if you come and sit in the chair across from me in a breaking free session, I will show you exactly what's there. It's real, it's powerful. And you're powerful, but you're more powerful than it. Why? Because greater is he who is in me than he who is where? In the world. And so if you don't realize it, the enemy's like, Phew, that's great. You just keep on letting me work. You keep on thinking it's your wife or your husband or your kids or the government or, you know, the news or whatever it might be. You just keep on thinking that. And as long as you're thinking that, then you'll ignore me and I'll keep on doing what I'm doing. And so God tells us, listen, I want you to put on the helmet of salvation. Why? Because you have to protect your mind from the enemy. He wants to control your mind. If he controls your mind, he controls your destiny. And the Bible tells us we got to be transformed by the renewing of what? Our mind. We're using the word of God to protect our mind. He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects my heart. It protects me from the enemy. It protects my heart. Why? Because out of the heart flows the issues of life. He tells us to gird our waist with the belt of truth. Why? Because you'll know the truth and the truth does what? Without truth, we don't have freedom. And so we have to have the belt of truth on because the truth combats the lies. Why? Because Satan, according to John chapter eight, is the father of what? He is the originator of it. So when you lie, guess what you're doing? You're doing his work, not God's work. Oh, it's just a little white lie. I don't care what color lie is, it's still a lie. So then he says, listen, I want you to shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of what? Peace. Peace is key. When you lose your peace, you know you're under attack. When you feel pressure on your peace, you know you're under attack. When you're on that car lot and you're about to sign your peace away, you know that's not of God. Amen? Amen. You've been there, right? That's why when they start trying to pressure you, it's like, I'm out. If I can't think on my own, if this is the deal that's only going to last the next 30 seconds, then I don't need that deal. If that young man that's dating you tries to pressure you into something teenager that you know you shouldn't do and you don't have a piece about it, you look at him and say, no way, get away from me. You're not taking my piece. There ain't nothing, there ain't no relationship worth your piece. There's no car worth your peace. There's no purchase worth your peace. Why? Because the enemy works where there is no peace. And he tries to take your peace. So if you walked in here and you don't have peace today, you're wrestling inside. 
then that's because you got influence that you don't know about. So you've shod your feet with the perspiration of the gospel of peace so you can stand your ground and then you take up the shield of faith and the shield of faith is able to quench what? The fiery darts of the enemy. The enemy is always shooting darts at us. The darts have all different kinds of forms. They have the form of a lie. They'll shoot a little, little, little depression your way because something happened you didn't control, you couldn't control, and now you feel, you feel down in your spirit. You don't realize what it is, and so you just let it come on in. You absorb it. And so the shield of faith says, you know what? I believe what God says over what the enemy says. I believe that God's power is more powerful than your power, and I don't believe what you're saying about me. I'm not a person who is worthless, unworthy. In the name of Jesus, I have value. Get out of here, Satan. Amen? So everything works together in the armor. You don't just take one piece of armor. You got to wear all the armor. And so as you're wearing it, he says, listen, I want you to take up the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of what? God. Swords are not, are not for cutting vegetables. Swords are for killing. I want you to hear me. Swords are for killing. This sword is to destroy the enemy. Because if you don't destroy him, he will destroy you. That's his goal, right? Kill, steal, destroy. And so God said, listen, you ain't got to put it with that. Let me put this in your hand. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Word of God has power. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to pierce between the, the bone and the marrow, between the intents of man. And so you want to know what you're thinking is right or wrong? The sword of God's Spirit, the Word of God will tell you if it's right or wrong so that you'll know the difference between what the enemy's trying to tell you and what God is trying to tell you. We need to be prepared. I know a lot of people today, they're, they're into this movement to prepare your kids for the bullies in school, right? So you send them to jujitsu or MMA or, uh, you know, you, you teach them how to play uh, t-ball because at least they could hit somebody with something, right? Except they can't hit that ball even if it's not moving. And so, you know, you, you do all these things because we're wanting to prepare them for a battle that they're walking into. And so if somebody comes at your daughter, you want them to be able to take care of themselves, but you know, there's one thing that we oftentimes never take into account is that God gives us a tool that people don't teach their kids because they don't even know how to use it themselves. Before I tell you what it is, I'm going to tell you by a story. There's a missionary lady, uh, Mr. and Miss Williams. Her name was Miss Williams. And they were in Jamaica, and I did <clears throat> mission work in Jamaica for uh, quite a few years. I go out in the hill country and preach revivals and uh, see a lot of different things. On well, one occasion, at the mission complex where they trained local teenagers and young kids, they trained them, first of all, how to become a Christian, and then they would train them in a vocation so that they could leave out and actually have a job to survive in the community. Well, on this particular occasion, a person walked on to the campus, which was probably about I don't know, 40 acres, and walked up to the house and walked through this lattice gate into the courtyard, and Miss Williams was standing there. The person pulls a knife out on her and says, give me all your money or I'm going to kill you. Well, Miss Williams didn't know any jujitsu. Jiu she probably didn't know how to spell it. She didn't know any MMA. She didn't have a gun. She didn't have anything except the tools that God had given her. She looked at this person in the eyes. She could see the wickedness in him. She said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to drop that knife and turn around and leave. Now, she wasn't speaking to the man anymore. She was speaking to the demon. You know what happened? His hand came open. The knife fell out. He turned around, walked away. She never saw him again. Parents, when's the last time we taught our kids 
Hey, when that bully comes at you, tell him in the name of Jesus, get away from me. Why don't we teach our kids that? Why don't we give them a real tool to use? Because the weapons that God gives us are better than any weapon on this earth. They're stronger, they're more powerful. And so our mind has to go there because listen, when somebody walks in front of us and they're bullying us, all we see is the flesh. And God says we don't battle against flesh and blood, but we only see the flesh. And so we wanna hurt them, we wanna conquer them. When God says, listen, you need to see something different that's influencing and manipulating them so that you can actually win the battle. And so in this battle that we're in, this armor is extremely effective. And one of the pieces of the armor is in the name of Jesus. And then you give the command. God, I pray they leave me alone. No, 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 no. In the name of Jesus. Get out of here. In the name of Jesus, stop bullying me. In the name of Jesus, get away from me, anger. In the name of Jesus, you have authority. You have power. Use it. In the name of Jesus, spirit of depression, get away from me. In the name of Jesus, spirit of worry, get away from me. In the name of Jesus, spirit of poverty, get away from me. In the name of Jesus, spirit of anger, get away from me. In the name of Jesus is where your authority and your power lie. And he gives it to every believer. So when we began to use this armor, there's a piece of it that we oftentimes just dismiss. We we preach the whole thing so all the armor's done with and then we just walk away and we leave the last piece laying on the table, which is probably one of the most powerful pieces. And he tells us at the very end. He says, praying in the spirit at all times. Let's just put it up here so we can see it. Praying in the spirit at all times and on every, y'all with me back there? I know it. In the name of Jesus, put that up there. (laughs) Praying always in the spirit with all supplication, being watchful to this end. Staying alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Go back to the first part of it. We skip part of it. So we pray in the Spirit at all times with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I'm reading a different version. That's the NLT. I have the New King James. But I want you to see what it says. Praying in the Spirit, how often? All times. On what occasion? Every occasion. So there's always an occasion, right? When your wife is mad at you, boom, there's an occasion. When your husband's mad at you, boom, there's an occasion. When your kids are rebelling, boom, there's an occasion. When your parents don't know what they're talking about, boom, there's an occasion. When you're mad at your boss, there's an occasion. He's saying always praying with prayer and supplication on every occasion and stay alert. Why? Because you got to use this. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayer for all the believers. And so what he's trying to tell us here is that when we get into this spiritual battle, we need to be praying for each other, for all the saints. So listen, wives, if your husband knows Jesus, he's a saint. I know he might not act like it all the time. He's still trying to fit his shoes that God's given him. I understand that. But he's still that. And so instead of lashing out, pray out. Why? Because you're using a tool that's effective. If he's under spiritual attack, he doesn't need your attack. He needs your prayer. Same thing. Listen, guys, if, you're, if your wife or your girlfriend, if she's attacking you, she don't need you to attack back. She needs you to pray back. Pray her back to the place she needs to be. And so God has given us a tool here to use, and we use it because when we pray, it brings unity. But here's what prayer does. Prayer immediately steps you into the spiritual realm. Amen. Immediately. When you pray, you are outside the physical 
When you pray, you're outside the physical into the spiritual because you're trying to influence the physical through the spiritual. And so when we pray, we say, God, I believe that you're more powerful than this attack. I believe you're more powerful than this anger, this depression. And so when you begin to pray, you begin to activate the whole army of God on your behalf because you're praying to the Lord of hosts of all the armies of heaven. Now, what do you think that'll do? Whatever it needs to. God has power. And he's saying, All you got to do is pick up the hotline. Do you realize that? Anytime you want to talk to God, boom, he's there. Anytime. I mean, you, listen, you have access to the creator of the universe. You have access to the strongest person ever. You have access to the one to meet every need. You have access. It's like, how many of you ever watched the Batman? Ever watched Batman? You know, when when Gotham City was under attack, he would go pick up the what? He'd pick up that phone, right? And all of a sudden, this, this light's shining into where? Heaven. When you pick up the prayer line, the light of the Holy Spirit is shining into heaven. And God is moving on your behalf. That doesn't mean he's giving you everything you ask for. He's giving you everything you need. And so God is saying, listen, pray on all occasions. And I think we have more occasions than we realize, right? Because sometimes when we pray, we pray to celebrate. Sometimes when we pray, we pray in desperation, but we're praying. And when we pray, guess what? It's hard to worry when you pray. It's hard to stay angry at your spouse when you're praying for them. You got to decide, am I going to pray or am I going to get mad? I would choose prayer. Even though it does feel good to get angry sometimes, doesn't it? Because the enemy is trying to coax you into that direction to open that door. So pray, pray. You see, let me tell you a sign that you know you're under attack spiritually when you don't want to pray. When you rather gossip about somebody than pray for them. That's a sign of the enemy's attack. When you rather be angry than pray. When you rather speak harsh words than pray. When you rather you fill in the blank. You see, all those other things are not manifestations of the Spirit of God. They are manifestations of the enemy. But when we pray, it's like fingers on a chalkboard to the enemy. He cannot stand it. Why? Because he wants your praise. And he doesn't get your praise when you pray because God's getting your praise because your attention is on him. Your focus is on him. And so God is trying to get us to understand, listen, this might not look like a piece of the armor, but it sure does empower the armor. So use it. Use prayer. But he says something specific about this prayer that oftentimes is overlooked when people are teaching this passage. He tells us, listen, I want you to pray in the Spirit. Why in the Spirit? Because according to Jude chapter 20, he says, says, listen, I want you to build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, what does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? Because it must be important because when I do it, it builds my faith up, right? Right? And so when I have faith, guess what? When we activate the armor of God, we don't activate it without faith. We gotta believe that the word of God is powerful. We gotta believe that I'm, um, I can walk in the truth of God because God tells me the truth. We got to have the shield of what? Faith. And so faith is a key component. And so when I pray, it builds my faith. Why? Because I'm not trusting what I can do. I'm trusting what God can do. So we pray in the Spirit. But what does that actually look like? Because apparently there's something supernatural about it, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 27. He says, And the Holy Spirit helps in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. You ever been there? You ever feel like, God, what am I supposed to pray for? 
I had somebody call me and say, hey, I'm, I'm, they got ALS, and they're like, uh, can you help me? They want to go through breaking free deliverance. And so I got off the phone, I was like, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to pray? Every prayer is not a prayer of healing. Sometimes there's a different kind of prayer. And so he says, listen, when you don't know what to pray, he said, but the Holy Spirit prays for us. Why? Because the Holy Spirit knows what to pray. The Holy Spirit prays for us with this confusing part, groanings. This isn't, it's not the kind of groaning like, you know, when you accidentally hit the wrong nail with a hammer, you know, the one that's attached to your finger. That's not the kind of groaning. It's, it's not the kind of groaning where you stand up, you know, oh, my back. It's not that kind of groaning. He says groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So apparently there's something about this prayer that's a little bit different than maybe what we understand because we can't really comprehend it because it's not really words. It's groanings. You say, well, how do you groan and pray? That's a great question. Years I like, I don't understand this. How am I going to groan and pray? Who's doing the groaning? Me or the Holy Spirit? I'm like, why is the Holy Spirit groaning? He, didn't, he don't need to say anything. He's communicating directly to the Father. Matter of fact, he's one with the Father. But apparently, when I pray this way, that I pray through this pathway, and when I pray this way with these words, that it's, let's see the next part. I think there's more to it, isn't there? It says, and the Father... And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. So here's what he's saying is, is when I pray this way, that the Spirit is praying for me. Now, now let me get you, let me help you understand the picture here. When I or you become a believer, you trust your life with Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the Bible says that His Spirit is joined with our Spirit. So that'd be like the Holy of Holies. There's nothing touching that. There's no demonic influence in that area. The Spirit of God is not subject to demons. That's protected. But my flesh, my will, all that is open territory. So when I pray this way, he's saying that the spirit, who's connected with my spirit, will take that prayer and will always pray it according to what God's will is. Not necessarily your will, but what God's will is. And what, what God does is God always answers prayer when we pray according to his what? Will. That's what the Bible teaches. And so it's important to understand this because if I want to pray effectively, then I need to be praying according to God's will because when I pray that way, I know I always have the answer. So what is this then, this thing he's talking about? Now, I just want to be very transparent with you. For all of my ministry except the last five years, I never really got this. I always read people that were scared to go into this realm. So I'm about to tell you something that might make you afraid or might make you be filled with unbelief. So before I tell you that, I want to make sure you have the right mind in it. So I want to pray for you. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind any spirit of unbelief in any person in this place right now in the name of Jesus God, in the name of Jesus, I bind any spirit of the strong man in anybody in this place. You have no authority. We set you aside. You will have no influence in anybody's minds. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, now that we're able to hopefully receive what God has, I want you to grasp this, that groan means an utterance. So, you know, it can be... Mm, it's not, oh, no. It's a groan. It's an utterance. And so the thing is, is that it's not understood. You see, if you hurt yourself and you're, you know, you're groaning and your friend comes up to you and you can't say what's wrong with you, he cannot translate your groans, all right? He just looks at you and says, oh, man, you must be hurting. But this kind of groaning 
in order to understand it, what we do is we just look at Scripture, right? I mean, I can't make anything up here that helps you understand it. So let's see what the Scriptures say regarding this topic because it's so important because it's connected to activating in the use of the armor that God gives you. So in 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 15, let's just read what the Word of God says. For if I pray in what? Tongues means utterance or groan. It's not intelligible. My spirit is praying. So he said in Ephesians, praying always in the spirit. And now he's saying over here in 1 Corinthians that when I pray in a tongue, my spirit is praying. So there's a connection here. You might not like it, but it's there. All the Baptists are getting afraid right now. All the Methodists, they checked out a long time ago. And so listen, come back to me, okay? Let's just look at what the Word says. This is just the Word of God. I'm not making this up. I'm just showing you what's there. Don't throw stones at me. Don't send me any emails. If you send emails, it's Chris Comstock at <laughs> X Rose Church 9 Okay. He says, my spirit prays, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Now, this is a part that doesn't make sense, right? Well, he actually says that. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. Um, well, then, what shall I do? Well, some people say, well, if it don't make sense, don't do it. But this is not what he says. He says, I will pray in the spirit and I will also pray in words of understanding. So apparently there's a difference, right? He gives you the distinction of two different things. One is when I pray and people understand. We know how to do that, right? We may not like to pray a lot because we're like, I just don't know how to talk to God. You know, how do you talk to God? Well, you, you talk to everybody else, talk to God, okay? I mean, it's, some of you have the gift of talking. You just talk, talk, talk. It's like that Run DMC, remember that old song, you, you talk too much, you never shut up. That's your gift, right? Well, just use it with God, you'll be powerful. You got more communication than the rest of it, just use it, lean into it. It's just a conversation. I will pray in the spirit, but I also pray in words I understand. I understand. Again, so apparently the words in the spirit, I don't understand. Y'all tracking with me? Are y'all tracking with the word? Okay, let's keep going. And I was singing in the spirit and I also sing in words I understand. So what God is telling us here as we look at it at face value, is when we talk in Ephesians, he says praying always in the spirit, then it's connected with praying in tongues, which is an utterance or a groaning, and I don't understand it, it's unintelligible. And so when we pray this way, people think we're weird because we typically do it in the wrong context. What God is talking about here is your prayer language. Every believer has your own prayer language. You don't know it because many of you never tapped into it. You've never been empowered to release it. The Holy Spirit is there. So if you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has the ability to pray for you. Why would he not do it for some people and do it for others? It's not the gift of tongues talking about in Scripture, which is totally different than this. This is a prayer language. This is your private prayer language that God has given you and I to communicate with him, and it has powerful benefits to it. So if I were the enemy, which I'm not, I definitely wouldn't want you to use this. Here's why. If you don't understand it, he doesn't understand it. When you pray in English, Spanish, whatever language you speak, whatever demons are in that region that you live in, they understand exactly what you're asking for. And you don't know how powerful this is. But I discovered how powerful it is. I had somebody scheduled for a deliverance session. They came in for that deliverance session. They walked in the room and they said out loud, I only have two hours. 
Guess who heard? I only have two hours. Every demon in the voice reach of that person. So you don't want to know what happened during that two hours? Nothing. Because those demons inside of that person said, all we got to do is wait two hours. And so when you're doing deliverance, you don't talk about deliverance. You just do it. Because you don't want to let it out. You say, well, Greg, that sounds crazy. This is the crazy part. The next time that person came back, I said, we'll be here till we get done. Five hours. Boom, boom, boom. Every one of those spirits coming out, coming out. There's power. There's power in what we say. But the enemy doesn't need to know everything we're saying. And so God gives us this supernatural gift to pray in the spirit or pray in tongues. And it's an utterance. It's not intelligible. You don't understand it. And so when you don't understand it, here's the way the enemy works. He's like, you're not doing anything. You don't even know what you're saying. Well, that's exactly what God said would happen, right? He didn't say you would understand it. So guess what? You know why it builds your faith up when you pray in the Spirit? Because you got to trust that the Holy Spirit is taking what he needs to take to God. It's a different level of faith to pray this way. Because it doesn't make sense to the human mind. It makes sense in the spiritual realm. And the demons hate it when you pray this way because they have no clue what's happening anymore. So the other thing, though, is, is what the Scripture said in Jude chapter Jude, Jude 20. There are no chapters in 20. In Jude, there's just one book. He says, when you pray in the Spirit, it builds you up in your most holy faith. Praying this way builds you up. How does it build you up? This is what it does. When you're praying in the spirit, it, God is doing something inside of you. And he begins to release things in you that you didn't know were in there through the Holy Spirit. He begins to release different gifts because he said, all right, now I got a vessel that'll trust me. He don't have to understand it. He'll trust me though. And that's what God wants you and I to be at. You don't have to understand everything, but do you trust God with everything? It doesn't all make sense. The Christian life doesn't all make sense, right? I mean, you look at the religious guys. They were so upset with Jesus because it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense that he was healing people on the Sabbath because he cared more about people than their tradition. It didn't make sense that Jesus walked on water. It didn't make sense that the blind could see. It didn't make sense that he called Lazarus out of the grave. It didn't make sense. See, that stuff doesn't make sense. Why? Because faith doesn't fully make sense. And so when you pray in the spirit, you're praying in faith and it doesn't make sense, but that doesn't take the power away from it. Amen. And so when you pray this way, God begins to do supernatural things. I didn't pray this way for most of my life until five years ago, God did something in my life. I started praying this way. Let me tell you what's happened. I went from praying short periods of time to praying for hours and not even realizing it was ours. You know how when you're praying, you're trying to think of all those things you need to pray for? And then before you get to number five on the list of all the people, then you just start saying, um, ditto, God, ditto, ditto. Yeah, yeah, same thing I pray for those other people, you know. You just, it's like, I can't think of any new words, you know. Am I the only one that does that? It's like, God, I need some new words. I feel like I'm saying the same thing. And the guy's like, no, you just need, you need a new language. So I began to pray that way. I began to see supernatural things happening in an accelerated level. I began to get a different level of revelation from God's word when I studied it. It's like, you know, it's like an onion. You start peeling layers off. The word of God is the same way. You know, you can read a passage this year and read the same passage next year. I was reading the same passage within a month and it was illuminated and I began to say God I, I don't I need wisdom and knowledge to be able to do what I, and and I began to ask for that and I pray for it I said God when are you going to give it to me when are you going to give it to me and God didn't even tell me when he was going to I'm like God can't you hear me I mean I'm praying in the spirit and then I sat down for my first session of deliverance with somebody and all of a sudden the revelation came 
He would tell me to ask questions that made absolutely no sense to me. But when I'd ask them, I'd say, oh, I see. I see, yeah, that's wisdom and understanding. And so if you, listen, if you're just trying to be a Christian, you don't want to go to that level. But if you get to where I was in that moment before I started that journey, I said, God, I want everything you have. I feel like something's missing, God. I want all of it. If you're hungry for it, God says he will give, to the, Holy, he will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him. Unbelievers don't ask for the Holy Spirit. Believers are asking for more. And I kept asking and asking. And all of a sudden, this, this prayer language uh, was released in my life. And, and I began to pray this way. And then all the other things began to stack up. And I still think there's more. Guess what? I want all of it. I want all of it. It's like going to a buffet and it's all dessert, you know, and you just wish you could hold more, but you get full too quick. You ever notice that? And you're like, I just want more, but I can't hold it. And I'm just like, God, give me more. Give me more. Is there anybody in here who will testify, God, I want more by amen? Can you say amen to God? Give me more. But here's the amazing thing. You have all of it. He just wants to release it. He's waiting on you. And for some of you, listen, this is your step, is you gotta step into this and begin to do what God's called you to do because it's available. Every believer has a prayer language, but most believers have no idea that they have one because you don't know how to activate it. And listen, let me tell you what God says regarding this. In 1 Corinthians 14, 39 through 40, He's talking about the difference between praying and speaking in tongues. He says, listen, earnestly desire to prophesy. Do not forbid the speaking in tongues or with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. What God is trying to get us to understand here is that people have misunderstood this gift and they've used it wrong. Praying in the spirit is not what we do in church service. If somebody speaks in tongues in church service, it should be a prophetic word that somebody else stands up and they give the interpretation. If the interpretation is not there, the Bible says sit down and shut up. Give you the short version of it. Why? Because everything should be done decently and in order. So God is not a God of chaos. God's not calling us to start running across the back of the chairs. God is calling us to run to him and not be afraid of what he wants to give us. And so I think because of the misuse, we're afraid of it. I'm not talking, you know, people say, are we going charismatic? We're just going where Jesus goes, okay? Wherever he goes is where we want to go. But we're not going to be a weird church. We want to be a supernatural church. We don't want to limit what God can do because of our unbelief. We want God to have free reign to do what he wants to in his order, in his decency, and with his plan. And so when you pray in the spirit, you're not praying out loud in church service. Why? Because nobody's edified. Nobody's built up. You might be in a prayer meeting where everybody in there prays in the spirit, and it's okay to pray in the spirit because you're not there to edify anybody. You're not there to build them up. You're there to pray together, right? And if you pray in the spirit, then God's, we're praying according to God's will. But if you pray in English, listen, that's okay. It doesn't make you a second-class citizen. It just means you're missing something God wants you to have. You haven't released it. And so don't think that, you know, God doesn't love you because you haven't done this. God loves you, but he wants to release it. You say, well, Greg, how does he release it? Wednesday night at 6.30, I have a last session of our class on the Holy Spirit, and I'm gonna walk our class through how to activate this gift. So if you wanna come, you come. I'm not gonna do it in this room because everybody else would think you're crazy. Crazier than you already are kind of thing, you know. So we're not gonna do that. But I do want to tell you that this is something that God wants us to tap into. As a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy 1 through 1, 6, he told Timothy, he said, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Usually when they laid hands on somebody, they would manifest, you see in the book of Acts, through speaking in tongues. A lot of people call that the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of a sound mind. So it makes sense that, hey, I'm believing you, God. But he says, stir it up, stir it up. The other day I was out working, and you know, every time, does everybody get, ever get tired of drinking water all the time? It's just like, oh, God. It tastes like this plastic bottle right here, right? So I had some of that uh, crystal light. So I poured some of it in there, and I grabbed my bottle again, drank it, and realized, oh, I haven't stirred it up yet. It's all at the bottom because it still tastes the same, just very, t- very faint. And so when you stir it up, it, it permeates. It permeates the whole bottle, right? And so this is what God's saying about the Spirit of God. He stir, let him stir up in you. Let him stir up so it permeates all of who you are. Stir it up in such a way that, that he overcomes you and overtakes your life and overtakes who you are. And then you begin to walk in the Spirit. You begin to talk in the Spirit. You begin to pray in the Spirit. You begin to function in the Spirit. And then the enemy doesn't have any power over you because then you realize you have authority. You have supernatural authority. It began to use it. You're not afraid to tell that demon, hey, in the name of Jesus, get away from from me. In the name of Jesus, you can't have my child. In the name of Jesus. And you began to use the tools that God's giving you. Why? Because the Spirit will always lead you to spiritual tools. So activate it. Stir it up. You know how to get stirred up, don't you? You know how to stir your spouse up, right? You poke at them, right? Start poking at the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? With the Word of God, by saying, God, I want all you got. I want all you got. Can you pray that prayer? God, give me all of it. Give me all of it, God. All of it. The question is, are you brave enough to ask that? And keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And what God will do is he'll open up something for you that you've been waiting for all your life. And I can tell you this, I would never go back. I would never, ever go back. Because I realize now, if I would have had these tools when my kids were smaller, there'd be some things they wouldn't have went through. Because I would have cast that spirit out in the name of Jesus. There are people that came up to me in church before and they were suicidal. And all I could tell them was just read the word. But now what I do is say, read the word, but come back here in this back room for you. We're going to get that spirit out of you right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Don't lay down your tools because the world doesn't embrace them. The world should not embrace your tools because they're supernatural. Church, we need to be a little more weird than we really are because the things in Scripture are not normal. They are supernatural. And if you're looking for a normal life, Jesus is not it. That's what the world has. But if you're looking for a life of freedom, then sign up to go through Breaking Free Deliverance Session. Breaking Free at xrosechurch.net. Breaking Free at xrosechurch.net. That is the email address. You type it in. You say, I want to be involved in a Breaking Free Session. We'll send you the information. Listen, if you don't have anything in you, guess what? Nothing's coming out. But if you do, which I have a hunch you do, a real good hunch. Do you want to get rid of it? There'd be 200 something people in here say amen to that. I'm here to help you. I don't want to make you feel weird. I don't want to make you feel outcast. If you don't pray in the spirit, I'll still love you. If you come in here with all the demons you've always carried around, I'll still love you. I'm not going to love them. I'm going to keep trying to direct them away. But if you want to be free, take a step. Now, this is what I know happens almost in everybody. When you send that email, something's going to start stirring in you. You're going to be afraid. You're going to be anxious. You're going to be worried. Why? It's like when you didn't pay your rent and the eviction notice comes. You see something starts stirring inside of you, you know? Well, that's what you're saying. The eviction notice is coming, and they realize they're about to get kicked out. 
and they stirred up about it. So if you feel that, understand what it is. When I first told this to my elders, two of them in the room said, I feel weird inside. I feel like I need to run out of the room right now. Guess what? They all went through it and every one of them had something. I say something. Multitudes of something. So right now, here's your next step. When you wake up in the morning as a sign of obedience and just a sign of your preparation, put on the whole armor of God. Walk through it. Walk through it. You're reminding yourself. You say, when did you ever take it off? You're just reminding yourself. Putting it on from head to toe to shield to sword. The other thing is, is come on Wednesday night so I can teach you how to release the gift that's already in you. Your prayer language. And the other thing is, is this Easter is one week away. Let's take back God's community. Let's step into the darkness together and invite people that don't go to church to come and know Jesus Christ. There is only hope in Jesus And so I want you to take this serious that we are in a spiritual battle and you are walking into the kingdom of darkness and you're trying to pluck people out of that kingdom and put them in God's kingdom. You gotta go get them. You gotta go get them. So take that card and invite somebody. Take multiple cards and invite somebody. Do not show up for Easter by yourself. You don't wanna show up to heaven by yourself, do you? I hope there's a line of people beside you. Oh, they're with me, Jesus. They're with me. Yeah, I brought, I brought them to church and, 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 and they got to know Jesus and they got saved and they're with me, they're with me, they're with me. Don't show up to heaven by yourself. We're in a war. Let's go attack the enemy this week. Let's go get back what God wants. He wants his people that he created to save them. Let's make a difference this week. Let's bow our heads. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the commission that you have on our lives to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these signs shall follow those who believe. They will cast out demons in your name. They will speak in new tongues in your name. They will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed in the name of Jesus, God. I commission your church by your power and your authority that we're going out to do your business. And we are not afraid because he who is in us is greater than he that's in the world. And God, if anybody in this room doesn't know you this morning, I pray, God, that during this invitation time, they would come down front and tell one of our our counselors, I want to get saved this morning. It's in your name we pray, amen.